Um, okay, uh, so I didn't actually time myself giving this talk. Um, it is entirely possible that it's longer than 45 minutes, um, but I hope it's interesting enough to justify your time, or you can just drop out, watch it on YouTube later at you know 1.5x and see it in whatever time you wanna get through it. Um, there we go. Um, so just a little background on me, because uh, you know, some I when I started out in HPC or or even before that, I actually was like, oh well, I didn't start programming, you know, when I was twelve. So clearly, I am doomed. I will never be able to be successful in the computer technology industry. See, I grew up in Seattle, and and I knew kids who worked for Microsoft in high school and are probably retired now. Um, and so I just assumed, you know, if you if you didn't get in early, you 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 missed the boat. And so I didn't I didn't do any programming outside of MATLAB until I was 25. So if you're not 25 and you're here, you're way ahead of me. Uh, so I, I went to PNNL uh, in Eastern Washington and I did an internship on NW Chem. Uh, as folks probably know, I've been working on NW Chem since, so I had a great time. Um, when I was there, I, I used Itanium. It was also a Quadrix network. It's a beautiful machine. Um, I don't like it when people talk bad about, uh, about Itanium. I think I th think it was great. At least Itanium 2 was awesome. Um, and, and I started doing Fortran. I learned how to use Linux a little bit there. Um, I wasn't doing anything chip aware. So, you know, the fact that Itanium was VLIW didn't matter. It, it ran and became well, had a Fortran compiler and a Balazs library. Uh, so in 2009, I went to Argonne, worked on the blue jeans. I learned a lot of stuff there. I learned how to actually program in C correctly. I did some stuff with MPI, uh, did a lot of stuff with MPI. Uh, and I worked on a few of the codes that some folks know, quantum chemistry codes. I have all sorts of fun war stories about MW Chem and Dalton and MPQC on BlueGene. Um, only, I'll, I'll tell only one war story here if you want, feel free to ask me fun stories offline. Uh, I joined Intel in 2014. I worked on a bunch of different HPC stuff, Knight's Landing, Omnipath, AVX 512, stuff I can't talk about or stuff that doesn't exist. Um, I learned some stuff about OpenMP uh, and got my start with C++. Uh, I joined NVIDIA in March. I'm part of the HPC team. I work on software. Uh, I work on ARM software in particular. So that's one of the big reasons I'm here. I also work on Fortran uh, and application stuff. And, you know, as of two weeks ago, I, I moved to Helsinki. So I'm, I'm on European time uh, with, with a strong emphasis on European customer engagement, although obviously I talk to folks around the world. Um, if you want to know anything more, it's probably on GitHub or linked from GitHub. And I like to talk to people on Twitter, uh, or you can find me on other things if that helps. So uh, outline of this talk. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about porting, a little bit about optimization, a little bit about scaling, and, and then I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of a pitch for some of the things we're doing with NVHPC um, that I think is interesting to folks, even though this workshop is focused on ARM CPUs. Uh, obviously you're here because you're, you're interested in porting to new platforms. And so, so maybe interested in what we're doing uh, on that front. Um, and, you know, a lot of people make much better slides than I do. Um, these are really text intensive and I do that in part uh, because I'm lazy, but also uh, because uh, I know many people uh, don't speak uh, fluent American English and I don't speak perfect American English either. Um, and so hopefully it makes it easier, especially if you're reading these later that I put lots of text on the slides. So, you know, I'm not going for, for awards for prettiest slides by any means. Okay. so. This, this, is, this is a traditional software ecosystem. And I throw this out there in part, you know, for, for anybody who hasn't been around a long time, how lucky you are. Um, used to be that, you know, what you got when you got an HPC system, you got a POSIX operating system, mostly, probably mostly correct. Some form of Unix might've been a weird, nasty form of Unix, might've been Linux. You got a C, C++ compiler. Usually get a Fortran compiler. I've used systems that didn't have a good Fortran compiler, didn't have one at all. Um, those weren't a lot of fun, uh, but I've, I've gotten friendly with F2C over the years because I had to. Um, they uh, you know, usually get an MPI library and usually get a Blas library written by somebody who probably knows what they're doing. Um, and then you get some more stuff and who knows what it is, depending on which center 
uh, and, and how full service they are, you, you get some other stuff. And then sometimes the vendors give you more stuff. Craig gives you a lot of packages. Um, sometimes you don't get any packages and you build it all yourself um, or you have other people that help you. Um, and then there's everything else. So, so obviously, you know, you're, you're very rarely going to log into a machine and find everything you need is already compiled. Um, the exception, fun exception for me was, you know, at PNNL, um, they have a script that runs NWCAM for you. So, so that, that, that is like the one exception where you can, you can literally do nothing. You show up with your NWCAM input files, PNL supercomputer, uh, and run it. But other than that, you know, you got to put in some work. Uh, but, but, you know, historically, you did not get a whole lot of stuff on your computer. So, so nowadays, life is a little bit different. Um, everybody uses Linux now. Um, you know, all the weird Unix, POSIX things have, have died away, for better or for worse. Uh, you pretty much always get GCC and LLVM. Uh, everybody supports those now. Um, you often get a vendor compiler that's, you know, pretty good, or, or maybe it's better and worse in some ways than others. Uh, you, you still get a BLAS library, hopefully. Uh, you get open MPI or, or MPitch, you know, most of the other things have gone away, which is mostly good. Um, you know, nowadays on most of your HPC systems, you've got some baseline package manager, whether or not, you know, if you're on a Cray, you wouldn't want to, you know, yum install most things. Obviously, you, you want to get the, the Cray built version of that, not the generic. But, but, you know, certainly there's a lot of machines out there where, where you get a standard apt yum environment. And that's amazing. You know, you don't have to build things like, you know, bin utils or, or, or autocom for CMake yourself anymore. Um, and, it, and of course, now we have SPAC, you know, um, that offers a lot more. There's, you know, I, I use Homebrew really heavily on my, on my Macs. So, that, so that's, that's amazing. And there's still the everything else. Um, and, and of course, I, I want to, you know, give a cautionary tale for anybody who's tempted, you know, to, to use HPC platforms that don't have the top three, just don't. Um, if some vendor comes to you and tells you they have an HPC system and it doesn't have a BLAS library, just tell them they don't have an HPC system um, and, and you'll both be happier uh, in life. If somebody tells you they have an HPC system and it, they don't have an MPI library, um, they don't have an HPC system. It's just not HPC if it doesn't have these things. Um, you can, you know, not everything has Aptium or SPAC, um, although, you know, obviously the SPAC team is trying to, to conquer the world with, uh, you know, all the HPC systems. So maybe someday that'll be there, um, you know, but certainly you should, you should prioritize the type of systems you use based upon how easy they are. And if somebody tells you they've got absolutely nothing um, outside of the top three uh, and somebody else offers everything, well, that's clearly a reason to, you know, that, that's, that's human. There's a real human cost to, to building all this stuff from scratch. Um, I am stupid and stubborn and old fashioned and actually like to build everything myself, but most reasonable people don't do that. Um, and of course, there's always going to be stuff you're going to have to do yourself. That's why we have day jobs. Um, otherwise, we just, you know, run simulations off of web interfaces and, and you know, life wouldn't be interesting. So porting. Um, and I, these are one of those do as I say and as I do, because I've already, I've already violated my own recommendations at least once this week. And, and, and I was uh, rewarded uh, negatively accordingly. So, you know, always start with the absolute simplest configuration. Um, if you ever do anything new, use GCC, use Netlib Blas, use all of the standard packages, the most basic stuff, get something that actually runs correctly, avoid all unnecessary problems. Um, you know, there's just so many things that go wrong the moment you start playing around. And I think everybody's felt a little bit of that pain already. Um, you know, it's tempting to read the manual and see that there's some magical CPU specific flag that, you know, maybe you should use for your chip. Don't do that. Just, just go with the generic settings unless your administer, administrator or operator has said, you know, really do this. You know, obviously on blue gene cross compiling, you have to do that stuff. Um, but, you know, in general, just go with generic stuff, let the compiler sort it out. Um, it is often a good idea, you know, and I'm sorry, I, I do focus on the blahs because I'm a quantum chemist and we do a lot of linear algebra, you know, other libraries are, are, are in here as well. But, you know, build Net, uh, Netlib Latepack from source if you aren't sure that somebody's built it correctly. And I say that because, so the first time when I ported NWChem to ARM, in 2014, um, 
it, it was interesting because back back in those days there were two different arm floating point abis um and they weren't compatible and so if your blas library was built one way in your application, like and it became was built another, you get the wrong answer um, or you get a seg fault. I can't remember which one, uh, but both are bad. Um, and and one way to avoid that is to to just build Netlib Latepack from source with the same compiler flag, so you know that they're compatible. Um, you eventually figure this out, but this is this is just one reason to build stuff to build Latepack from sources, so you guarantee you're getting the same compiler compatibility. Um, I reluctantly recommend that some folks build MPI from source. Um, I confess that I build open MPI from source and it did not work so well for me yesterday. Um, I had to build it from source for the Fortran or I chose to for the Fortran side of things, but then I LD preloaded the AWS um, MPI shared library and that worked great. Um, and the reason you do this, if it works, is that you can get debug symbols from a GDB backtrace with source line numbers. Um, at least for me personally, I like that because then I go read the source code of MPI to debug why things are going wrong. Um, I may be a weirdo. Not everyone may enjoy or be capable of uh, debugging MPI problems by reading the source code of MPitch. Um, but every once in a while, you see a pretty obvious problem in it. The world makes sense, and it's great to have line numbers. Uh, the other one, of course, is you, you use the same compiler. And this is absolutely critical for Fortran. Fortran modules are weird, makes me sad. Um, but uh, none of the Fortran modules are compatible. So if you have a G Fortran MPI module, it will absolutely not work with any other Fortran compiler. Um, so you have to do this. I wish the Fortran bindings were a separate project. Um, people in the MPI forum know that that'd be a good idea, but nobody's actually done it. So today you gotta build MP you gotta build the whole of MPI just to get a Fortran module. That's lame, but you know, such is life. Maybe somebody will fix this someday. Um, I don't always practice what I preach, but you know, use GDB early and often. Um, I have found the hard way. You know, GDB with MPI is really tricky, right? If you run MPI run with two processes and run GDB uh, interactively, obviously you can't really interact with two different GDB instances from one terminal. Um, there's this X term trick, uh, but that doesn't scale because, you know, then you get 64 X term windows and you need a really big monitor, et cetera. Uh, you can run GDB non-interactively and I added just a simple dumb example and you can read the docs to figure out the rest. Um, but if all you want is a backtrace, you can run GDB in non-interactive mode, script that thing, and that can be super helpful because oftentimes if you're just debugging a seg fault, you just need the backtrace so you know what line number to go look at in your code. Um, I've never found parallel debuggers to be particularly useful. That doesn't mean that they can't be. I just have learned to live with GDB over the years. Um, and you know, I, it's probably not really a useful recommendation now, but um, having done so for many years of my life, cross compilation sucks. Try not to do it. You know, I know people out there do like risk V work with QEMU and they do all this, you know, I'm the type of person when, when you really want to port to something, go out and buy the hardware, even if it's a Raspberry Pi because cross compilation sucks. Um, I'm gonna tell this fun story. This is the absolute hardest bug I've ever had to deal with. Um, I hope this nothing like this ever happens to you. Um, but this is the, this was the impossible bug for me, and, and so I just throw it out there as you know, because uh, it's a fun story. So so we had this application that I was helping to port. It was a physics, some crazy physics Monte Carlo uh, simulation code from from Rutgers on the Blue Gene, um, and it crashed during startup. And it crashed during MPI broadcast. And we could see that, you know, from the backtrace. So, you know, the first thing you do on BlueGene is you disable all the hardware magic and you just run the generic collectives. And that'll avoid the, you know, BlueGene P actually had five networks um, and MPI used four of them, or at least three, I think three or four. Um, and, and if you wanted, you, you would dodge one of those and that, that would sometimes, it would certainly take you down to for code path and MPI. So, so disabling collectives worked around the bug. So the app ran. And that was that was at least enough to run the app, and it didn't matter. So fine, that it was solved at that point. Um, and like three months later, I think I may have even, I think after Blue Gene was turned off, I eventually got an email from from a very smart fellow at, then at IBM, um, who, who was telling me that what he eventually figured this out, 
And what it was, was um, the Blue Gene Taurus Network had an undocumented requirement of 64-bit alignment. And that was almost always fine because the compiler would align the stacks and all sorts of things. Um, so it never showed up in anything unless you did some really weird stuff with, you know, with type punning and unions or whatever, or, um, and if you're really, really old, you may know about the archaic uh, alignment rules of Fortran common blocks. Um, it's kind of like C unions, but, you know, a lot less understood, a lot, lot less uh, blog posts about it. Um, and the, the way the hardware enforced this is by immediately terminating the job with zero diagnostics whatsoever. So if you hit this problem, what you would see is blank. You know, the, 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 the universe would disappear and you'd be in the void. Um, and um, so obviously this was super unhelpful. Uh, but eventually, and I don't actually know how he traced this down. Um, but yeah, all, 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 I guess the point of this is to say that if you debug things and they're not this bad, um, then you know consider yourself lucky and it's awesome. Um, but also, you know, in HPC we have some really weird stuff sometimes. Um, and you know, if you stay around HPC long enough, you may eventually have something truly weird and crazy happen to you. Um, I will also say, you know, G, uh, GPU debugging uh, is really tricky just because you have so much parallelism. And I haven't seen anything this bad in, in GPU land, but certainly, you know, GP, GPU debugging can, can be hairy. Um, and so, you know, prepare yourself uh, for, for fun times as, as hardware gets more interesting. Um, anyway, so I'm going to transition to performance, but I will start out by saying, uh, this was an, uh, a great quote that was on the wall in my first office at Argonne when I was a postdoc there in 2009. Um, it was Nick Romero had this on his cubicle and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Never forget this. The greatest performance improvement of all time uh, is when a system goes from a uh, not working to a working state. Okay. Um, John Oosterhout is a Stanford professor, very smart guy, built some cool things. He has a great website. You should read it. Lots of great stuff on it. But you know, never forget that um, a huge part of getting stuff done in HPC is getting stuff working. Um, we love to you know flex and say you know peak performance and exaflops and all these things. Um, the vast majority of science in the world is not done with codes that run at higher than five percent of peak, um, and that's okay um, because what matters is getting the right answers. And and I and and so just never. Never lose sight of the fact that that um, you should always aspire to get to the right answers uh, quickly, not to get to the the peak flop rate, uh, just because you know that's 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 what we seem to to value in in, in HPC conferences. So um, performance optimization uh, number one: do absolutely nothing. Uh, just go out and and use something that works well. Um, I interviewed with Google many years ago and they asked me to implement a really bad sorting algorithm. And, and I just always felt like if that's the way Google wants to hire people, then, then I don't know why I'd want to work there because the right answer for sorting is quick sort uh, in the standard library. Call quick sort and be done. You're getting a good algorithm and a good implementation. Yes, there are like 47 different caveats where you can beat it in corner cases and whatnot, but the right answer uh, until you prove otherwise, is always to do the least amount of work and to use the standard solution. This is especially true um, in, in mathematical libraries. Uh, never, ever, ever write matrix multiplication yourself, uh, call Blas. Um, it's amazing. I've heard that there are physicists in the 21st century who actually write matrix multiplication themselves and have not heard of DGEM. Um, that is very, very sad. Um, that is a waste of, of human potential. Um, do better things than, than writing linear algebra. There are like 14 people in the world who are actually uh, needed to do that. They're really good at it um, and they do it for a living and the rest of us should just call Blas. Um, and, you know, obviously as you get up the stack, you know, why would you ever write your own molecular dynamics package, run Gromax, NAMD, LAMPS, whatever. Um, those people, you know, there's, there's human millennia invested in the software ecosystem out there already. Um, unless you're planning on devoting a, at least a human decade to, to beating those people who are, who are a millennia ahead, um, you're probably gonna lose. Just don't do it. Um, just take what works and, and run with it. Um, second step, always profile. Um, you know, 
prof profile early and often forever. Um, you can, you know, you look at the code, you think you have an intuition, you think you understand, just profile it. Um, this is, of course, you know, if somebody tells you to go optimize the sorting routine, first profile and determine how much wall time is actually spent in sorting, Sp figure out why sorting is slow. And if sorting is slow um, because of reading from DRAM, then the answer is not going to be microarchitecturally optimizing quicksort um, because that doesn't change the the, the read speed of, of DRAM. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, the talk yesterday on ARM compilers already addressed this much better. And I, I can, you know, before you go in and start twiddling around with instructions and reordering statements in your loop, use O3 and fast math. Um, and, and again, profile verify correctness. Um, yeah, uh, you could probably beat this some of the time, you know, but something like GCC or LLVM has at least a human millennia of, of code optimization expertise baked into it. And you should not compete with that unless you are really, really, really sure you're going to win. Um, uh, next step, use something standard. Um, use a straightforward implementation of a known good algorithm. Don't try to be tricky. Don't go off and you know use Duff's device or other weirdo stuff. Just just go write something um, in a reasonable way using using an algorithm that you know is pretty good, um, and and see how far that gets you. Next step, use uh, generic as in non-processor specific optimization. You can hoist invariants if the compiler somehow isn't smart enough to do it for you. You can block loops. Most compilers are bad at blocking loops. Cray compiler can do some weird stuff. Intel compiler can do some weird stuff. Most compilers don't do much with loop blocking for good reason. Um, you can unroll, although you know it's interesting. I think many of the compilers now have a re-rolling pass because of people who foolishly, prematurely unrolled loops, the compiler goes in, re-rolls them, undoes all that work, and then unrolls it again in the back end using their own heuristics. So, you know, you might just be fighting with the compiler if you unroll your loop. So, you know, figure out whether or not, look at opt reports or whatever they're called from your compiler before you do this stuff. Finally, uh, if you actually genuinely believe that code optimization is necessary, Again, don't do it yourself. Go find a mercenary who does this for a living. When I was in DOE, you know, all the HPC centers had a mercenary or, or 10 who did this. Um, they just live for this stuff. They're super smart. You go give them a piece of code. You, you give them a profile. They ask you some hard questions. You get a reproducer and the magic comes out the other side. Um, all the vendors have these mercenaries. You know, John Linford uh, is a super smart guy, you know, has a, there are a team of people at ARM who do this stuff. I don't know everybody in the world that does this, but I know, know that people just everywhere. And finally, if all six other things have failed you, only then go read an architectural spec and go tune the code yourself. Um, really, really don't start with seven. Um, I know it's really tempting and it sounds like that's how you can, you're supposed to be in the HPC world, but, um, I've been around long enough to learn that that's actually the means of last resort. You really, really don't want to do that if you don't have to. Um, okay, so optimizations. One of the first optimizations that anybody should look at on a new new processor um, is is NUMA. This one is especially important. I will say this is probably the greatest source of architectural diversity in CPU land right now between Intel and AMD and the ARM ecosystem is how and what NUMA uh, there is. So um, MPI takes care of NUMA for you. I'll have another slide on that. NUMA control is there if MPI doesn't do it for you. HWLOC uh, is used by all the MPI and many other software, not just open MPI. Um, you can get a picture of your MPI library or, or your, your node, which can be really useful. Um, and I would recommend looking at that just for educational purposes. And just as an example, there's a brilliant write-up on the Ampere Ultra processor, which happens to contain three figures. One is Ultra, one is Xeon, one is AMD. Um, fun exercise, try to figure out which one of these is which based upon the colors or the pictures, um, and then go read the thing and actually figure, you know, learn about it. Um, but this is just, you know, this is based on memory latency. Um, bandwidth is also in there, you know, latency bandwidth roughly track, but not always. 
um, depending on the coherence protocol and some other things. Um, but this is just, you know, the green here means good performance. So obviously there's these, there's these NUMA domains and you get better perform, or, and, and I, more correctly, these are cache latencies. So this is NUCA, not NUMA. NUMA is related to this. Um, you really want to pay attention to this stuff. You can really, really hose yourself quite badly um, if you ignore NUMA. Um, if you're used to a two socket Xeon system with two NUMA nodes, you are definitely going to need to pay attention when you go to modern AMD or ARM CPUs. Although, as you know, was noted yesterday on, on Slack, at least Graviton is one NUMA node. You don't have to think about it. It's wonderful. Um, but in general, you want to really pay attention to this stuff. You can, you can get some very, very bad scaling curves um, by ignoring NUMA. So um, as a, at the programming model level, MPI is really good at NUMA because it's, it's really about private data first. Um, I gave a talk many years ago about this. You can find the slides at the link and look at some of that. Um, I will emphasize that at the time that talk was intended to, to provoke a whole lot of controversy at an academic conference and does not necessarily reflect a, you know, a high quality product oriented recommendation for, for any context. Um, but, you know, multi-threaded codes are usually sharing data, all of the data by default, and that's really bad for NUMA. Um, OpenMP usually scales like garbage across more than one NUMA node. Um, so don't do that. Mix MPI and OpenMP such that you run at least one MPI process per NUMA node and then use threads within that. If you're smart and you know what you're doing, you can get around this. You can either do private data OpenMP, which is more like an SPMD style. You usually write like MPI, but with OpenMP. Or you can, on the other hand, use MPI shared memory. Um, and you can theoretically shoot yourself in the foot with MPI shared memory, although MPI3 shared memory has some NUMA awareness built into it and, and tries to do a better job. And in fact, probably does a better job than OpenMP, um, although MPI shared memory has some other trade-offs that not everybody likes. If you use OpenMP, um, regardless of NUMA, really make sure you understand affinity and binding and placement. It's really important. Um, the default settings may be optimized for uh, minimizing the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. And in, in that regard, um, they may not be optimal. So make sure you pay attention to this stuff. Um, I will say, you know, MPI plus GPU affinity is still a little bit tricky. Um, there's no real standard solution there. There's a whole lot of easy heuristics. Um, but, you know, if you want to ask me about that someday, feel free to do so. Um, another type of optimization one needs for processors, um, you know, to understand is, is a cache policy. So as a very extreme example of this, um, BlueGene and x86 Intel were very, very different. Uh, so BlueGene had a write through cache, not a write back cache. Um, and that meant that the, by default, BlueGene behaved like an x86 non-temporal store, which is not the default because it's not the x86 TSO memory model. Um, and, and, you know, so this, there was a huge performance effect here coupled with the microarchitecture. So on a big core, like a Xeon or a core, like not a Xeon Fire and Atom, um, the x86 processors have this huge out of order window. So you can load, you take a whole bunch of load misses, um, try to read a bunch of data and, and the CPU will continue running and keeps without stalling for quite a long time. Um, Small core like Atom or BlueGene are almost or, or actually in order and they stall really quickly. And so what this, the net of this is on BlueGene, because it would stall if you had too many uh, misreads, uh, re reads that missed, um, but you could do lots of writes and they would just, they would just go straight through the cache. Um, if you did something like a matrix transpose, which has to do, um, either read or write contiguous with re, with the opposite um, non-contiguous, you you'd basically see the opposite loop ordering being optimal. So on BlueGene, you'd want to do all contiguous reads and strided writes. And on Intel, you'd want to do all non-contiguous reads and, and, and contiguous writes. And the contiguous writes you would want to do because the way Intel does TSO is you basically do like a read modify write on a cache line. So you really want to store a full cache line at a time. Um, 
you know, in, if you're not doing non-temporal. So this is just one example, extreme example where you actually want to change your code based on your market microarchitecture. Um, hopefully things are not as extreme between ARM and x86, but you know, these are, you know, if you really want to get into tuning for different chips, this is the kind of thing you want to pay attention to. I'm pretty sure that the Fujitsu chip will have different properties than x86 Xeon um, in this respect. I, I mean, I sort of know that for at least one example. Um, so that's that's a place where where you you still want to pay attention. I don't think graviton is is going to be so different. So maybe you can ignore this there. But but if you like these things, this look at something like matrix transpose. It's fun. Um, atomics. This is a this is going to be another one. Um, I really hope it doesn't happen. Most HPC codes are better than this, but there's probably quite a bit of enterprise legacy code um, that. Uh, unknowingly or um, perhaps stubbornly uh, and knowingly depends on the x86 memory model. Um, if you see a multi-threaded code that gives the wrong answer on ARM um, and the right answer on x86, it is not because uh, there's anything wrong with ARM. It is because someone has written code that violates the ISO C11, C++11 memory model um, and they are um, illegally depending on x86 memory consistency semantics in, in code and they have a race condition um, that's naughty. Um, it's not ARM's problem that people write naughty code. Obviously, you know, other languages you can, you can go off and, you know, decide, you know, what the right way to do this is. Um, but the important lesson here is do not actually think about hardware memory models. Don't think about x86. Don't think about ARM. What you should instead do is understand C++11 or C11 Atomics. Um, many years ago, I did, did a port of, of a multi-threaded code. Um, it, the Debian folks said their CI server was breaking. Um, and it was like, okay, um, the code in question was a bunch of assembly language Atomics for PowerPC and x86. And I looked at it and I said, well, I could go write some more assembly for every single processor in the Debian um, CI system, or I could just write C++11 and never think about it again until the end of time, uh, which is what I ended up doing. Um, so the one thing to pay attention there is if you don't give a memory consistency model on C++ or C11, it'll default to sequential consistency, which is usually overkill. Very few multi-threaded algorithms actually need that. Um, use the minimum consistency required. If all you need is atomicity, not ordering, say relaxed. If all you need is sort of send, receive, release, acquire consistency, use that. And if and only if you actually need a sequentially consistent behavior, do that. And if you use these memory model things correctly, uh, the compilers will do the right thing on all the processors and you will be happy. Um, I will also say, you probably shouldn't have to even think at this level because if you're doing parallel programming, you should really try to think at a higher level. You know, instead of thinking about atomics, think about what the concurrent algorithm is and see if maybe there's a higher level primitive. Um, instead of doing your own spin locks, use a lock that exists in, you know, or a latch or a barrier or whatever it is. C17 and beyond have a lot of this stuff now. Um, OpenMP has locks, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, use libraries, really try to come up with the highest level solution. Um, you will suffer less and, and, and probably get higher performance with greater probability of correctness. Um, Fortran doesn't really have a shared memory model, but OpenMP does. So, you know, don't rely on what OpenMP has here. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of reason to use Atomics and OpenMP. If you want a lock, use a lock. If you want uh, a barrier, use a barrier. If you want a reduction, use a reduction. Um, go to the highest level thing you can get away with. Um, uh, as Ollie mentioned um, about TLBs, um, so we've been using 4K pages for, I don't know, since 50 years. Um, you know, think about how long it took you to read 4K of data from, from you know, memory that was sewn by hand with you know, whatever copper wires or whatever they did back in those days, how long it took to read 4K 
uh, from memory and think that we've made computers at least a billion times faster. And we're still using 4K pages. Think about how many nanoseconds it takes to read 4K from, from some level of the memory hierarchy. Uh, it's just absolutely nuts that we would take a TLB miss every 4K. Um, computers do all sorts of crazy gymnastics to, to make this suffer less. Um, you can be nicer to computers and not use 4K pages. Um, you can use 64K pages, which I believe are the default on many ARM systems and, and many power systems. x86 still defaults to 4K, uh, but you can use 2 meg. You should really strongly uh, consider doing that as much as possible. Um, figure out wh whether ARM you should use 64K or larger. You know, if you use POSIX Memoline and give it a big alignment, it'll probably do the right thing behind the scenes. You can use uh, lib huge TLBFS, um, read the man pages. And then Debian and Red Hat, for example, um, provide OS level documentation. Hopefully you never need to read this. Um, I'm aware of at least one circumstance where one gig pages are good, um, but it's not, it's not a good one. Um, and they're a huge pain in the butt to use. So, you know, try not to think about one gig pages until, you know, memories get a lot faster. Um, hopefully we'll never need to use those often, but, but they exist and they're cool. Uh, you know, it's nice if you can map all of main memory in your TLB and never take a TLB miss ever again, that can be useful in some cases. Um, SIMD. Uh, so, so SIMD, no one likes SIMD. Um, I think and anyone who says that is a, is a liar or a masochist. Um, SIMD exists because instruction decoding isn't free. Um, and it's, it's, it makes architecture and performance easier to achieve together. Um, but the optimal SIMD width is still one. Um, so using SIMD and dense center algebra is pretty easy. Gather, scatter creates all sorts of headaches. Um, ABX 512 frequency binning creates another set of headaches. Um, I don't have to deal with that anymore, but you, know, you can find out some stuff from the internet about it. Um, Interloop vectorization is, is a common thing. It's low, it's low risk, low reward, um, but it, it rarely scales past 128, maybe 256 bits. Um, if the right way to address SIMD is to do outer loop vectorization, uh, which is sometimes called spimdization for single program multiple data in a Flynn taxonomy. You have to do code restructuring. You sometimes have to change your data structures. It can have huge payoffs. Um, I'll note that the success of CUDA has been largely driven by the fact that CUDA as a programming model um, predisposes people to think in a SPIMD sort of way. Um, CUDA is not the only SPIMD programming model, it's just probably the most successful one. Um, and it, you know, even though CUDA, you know, the CUDA backend isn't SIMD per se, or, or isn't SIMD in a CPU sense, um, it's still a great way to write code. You can do it on CPUs. A lot of people don't put in the time. But you know, if, instead of thinking about SIMD, don't think about intrinsics. Don't go off and figure out NEON or SSE or any of that nonsense. Restructure your code in a way that is amenable to outer loop vectorization and let your compiler do the appropriate SIMD or SIMT backend you might even get better performance just by restructuring your code in this way, regardless of whether SIMD instructions are used. Um, and you know, lastly, as an aside, just because I work at NVIDIA and I have some very smart colleagues who will beat me up, you know, if I don't make this clear, you know, NVIDIA GPUs are SIMT, not SIMD, and you say, well, what's the difference? You know, CUDA threads make independent forward progress as a Volta, um, and that's not like SIMD lanes, but. For most purposes, you don't need to think about this. What you really need to do is restructure your code, expose parallelism, um, use a programming model that favors SPIMD um, rather than interloop vectorization, um, and you will be happier and you won't have to think about this stuff uh, too much. Um, and I apologize, I think I'm, I'm gonna blow through the, the 45 minute boundary. Um, I, I hope nobody has a hard stop, but I apologize for anybody who does. Um, so scaling, um, always do easy stuff first. So the first thing is, you know, when in doubt, um, do the least amount of work possible. So the fastest way to optimize internode communication is to not do internode communication. So if you can replicate data, um, do that. You know, people say, oh, replicated bad, non-scalable. Well, you know, the people who say that um, were alive and using computers when they had like two megabytes of main memory. Um, nowadays, we have just such a stupid amount of DRAM in all of our servers, um, in part because you have to buy too much memory to get ECC chip kill. 
Um, that's weird. Don't really want to get into why, but you know, such is life. Um, we have so much memory nowadays. It's very rarely a bad thing to replicate data. Um, really consider doing that if it saves you a lot of bytes over the network, uh, the net result will be good. Um, yes, it probably will burn you if you wanna run on an exascale problem with the largest possible data set you, humans can imagine. Um, most of us will never do that. Um, so you know, replicate data to save communication, good idea. Uh, and you know, if your per MPI rank uh, data requirements are too big, well, consider using hybrid parallelism, adding some threads, and get, you know, instead of getting four gigs per core, get your 256 gigs per node or whatever it is, uh, 256 gigs per socket, um, and you'll have a lot more data to work with and be happy. You'll get a lot of other things that might work better without running one process per core, some, you know, Linux file IO, serialization, all that fun stuff. Um, so, you know, the, the, be the, be the best data movement is, is not to do it at all. Um, the cheapest way to, to synchronize is to not synchronize at all. So really look at independent uh, parallelism if you can. So molecular dynamics, think about replicas. You know, if you're, especially if your sponsor requires you to run in a stupidly large amount of nodes um, or they don't let you use a computer, then think about taking advantage of this. Um, do ensemble parallelism. It's a lot of fun to do it. A lot of science nowadays can be done with a lot of ensemble parallelism. Yeah, it's cheating, but, but it's the right kind of cheating if you get science done. Um, Really, really, really favor non-blocking MPI send receive. Uh, it's just the right thing to do. Um, it's almost always better. Uh, I actually don't know of any circumstance where MPI send receive blocking is better than non-blocking. Non-blocking collectives are more interesting topic. You should evaluate them. Um, there's some weird funky trade-offs. It's network specific. Happy to talk about it in Slack if, if you have questions. Um, Always make sure you're using the right MPI method for your algorithm. Uh, so if your pattern is a gather, use a gather. Don't use a send receive. Um, I'm going to give a caveat on, on the next next slide, but you know, in general, I see a lot. Um, you know, there, there's some there's some MPI optimization opportunities that involve just using the right pattern, not the wrong pattern. Um, take the low lying fruit and use it. So unfortunately, MPI is not perfect. Um, if it was, you know, a lot of things would be different in life. Um, they try to be optimal across an average use case. They're not locally optimal. Uh, there's a really good example, George Bureau's group uh, published with all the all V. All the all V is the hardest thing to optimize globally. Um, it's impossible to optimize globally. I'm absolutely certain of that. You just cannot do, uh, do everything right all the time. Um, so in some cases, you may find that you should move away from all the all V and do your own hand rolled send receive, I know I just violated my own advice, um, but the reason that you would do this is because you've profiled carefully, thought hard about it and analyzed your system, not because using MPI all the all V is bad. Um, so if MPI all the all V is your bottleneck and you know that, then go to the whiteboard and think about this and consider doing some special stuff, but otherwise don't. Implementations sometimes do some weird stuff. Blue Gene did all sorts of fun, weird stuff. I really loved it. Uh, it, it made my day job interesting uh, and made people think I was smart because I knew all this crazy, weird behavior um, that wasn't obvious to anyone else. Um, I gave a talk about it. Um, the slides are there. There's a YouTube video with the wrong slides. Sorry, but the audio is correct. Flip through it if you're curious. Um, it's, it's a little bit you know old at this point, but there's some funny stuff about MPI in there. Um, lastly, you know, don't, don't call MPI directly in your, in your complex applications. Try to wrap the communication and do that so that if you ever have to make a change or tweak or work around some MPI weirdness, um, you can do so one time and not n times for how many times your application calls a given MPI function. And you should especially do this if you're using C++ because there's all sorts of neat tricks you can do with MPI um, with data type recognition and, and whatnot. Um, and in the talk above, there are some good examples of that if you want to see them online. One of the biggest problems I observe in MPI scalability has nothing to do with MPI. It has to do with load balancing. Um, so if you see a, in your profile that MPI barrier takes 37% of the wall time, I 100% guarantee you that MPI barrier is not your problem. What you have is a serious load balancing problem that manifests itself in MPI barrier. 
Um, you could consider removing unnecessary calls to MPI barrier, but most likely what you need to do is figure out your load balancing problem and fix it. I'll note that um, systems like Term++, the reason Term++ is cool and awesome and used is because it does automatical load balancing in codes like NAMD. Um, that may not be a reason for you to use Term++, but is a reason for you to understand what Term++ does and how those strategies are useful and how load balancing can be done in elegant ways and maybe why task parallelism is good. Um, NWCAM uses a, um, a quote unquote dumb uh, load balancer, uh, but it turns out it weak scales brilliantly and addresses a whole lot of problems um, it takes care of a lot of the low-lying fruit in load balancing in NWCAM. Um, you can do better with algorithm awareness. There's a paper um, one of my students wrote many years ago when he was a student um, that shows some neat tricks you can try to do. Um, unfortunately, load balancing is often domain-specific and hard. This is a good reason to collaborate with computer scientists. Normally, computer scientists are not very useful for, for things related to computer technology and programming, um, but this is one case where computer scientists have actually been useful, um, and you might consider talking to them if you have a load balancing problem. Um, uh, lastly, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about NVHPC compilers. So I, I know many of you have been using them. Um, so you know about the ARMx86 support. They also support power. So they support all the CPUs. This is really neat. You know, um, as, as Ollie noted, you know, um, having a good Fortran compiler uh, besides G Fortran on every CPU is really important. They also obviously support NVIDIA GPUs with various programming models. Um, so, you know, in my, in my world, this is, of course, all the processors that matter um, and, and certainly all the dominant ones in the cloud today. Um, the programming model support, so, so we support ISO standard parallelism, which I'm going to talk about. This is a new thing. I Please pay attention to it. I think it'll be really important in the coming years. Um, it allows you to use the same code on CPU and GPU parallelism. Um, you know, OpenMP supports CPUs and GPUs, but you have to write completely different GPU OpenMP than CPU OpenMP. Um, and so it's really two different programming models. Um, ISO standard parallelism doesn't have that issue. It's not as widely supported because some vendors aren't as happy with it or some hardware doesn't, doesn't handle it as nicely. Um, but at least we at NVIDIA are supporting it on CPU and GPU and getting some really nice results with applications with it. There's also open ACC in our compilers, which of course support CPU and GPU. Um, and obviously very, very GPU specific, but CUDA Fortran and C, C++. Um, there's some blog posts and a YouTube video by my coworker, uh, Bryce. You can read, read all about this stuff if, if, if it's new. And of course, you can um, download the NVIDIA HPC compilers on your machine, you know, click through the license and W, get them. It's super easy to install them. Um, it's really nice. You can use them on your Raspberry Pi. You can use them on your laptop. Anything Linux right now um, is supported. So as an example of ISO standard C++ parallelism, you can find more details in the blogs and the videos. So this is the same code. Uh, so this is an OpenMP version. There's a C++ um, uh, transform reduce version. Um, transform reduce runs better on CPUs. Um, and it runs much, much better on GPUs, of course, than on CPUs because it's bandwidth limited and GPUs have massive amounts of memory bandwidth. Um, I also have Ampere Ultra numbers. I do not yet have Graviton numbers, although this is pretty easy to reproduce if somebody wants to do it. I don't know if Lulish is one of the codes in this pro program or somebody bid on it, um, but you can definitely do, do this on ARM CPUs as well. Um, and the beautiful thing is you can run the exact same ISO C++ parallel code on x86 ARM and on a GPU, zero code changes, um, and, and it just works. Obviously, not all the compilers support this perfectly yet, um, but we do, and GCC does on CPUs. And I know Intel's got some stuff with C++, C++ parallelism in, in, in the one API. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've tested that yet recently. Here's another example. Um, somebody did this. You can look this. This is another, there's a lattice Boltzmann C++ parallel code. Again, same ISO C++ parallel code runs way faster on a GPU because it is bandwidth limited. And obviously, um, you know, 40 gig stack HBM2E is much, much higher than the DDR4 in, in your standard commodity x86 systems. Um, but, you know, why not take advantage of that bandwidth and do nothing? in terms of code by just using C++ the right way. 
Um, lastly, because uh, Fortran is awesome, um, and because I personally did this and therefore want to talk about it, um, I did this in NWChem um, in some kernels. I haven't rolled this all the way into the full app, although I've done some other stuff with NWChem that is upstream now for GPUs, if you're curious. Um, but you can see, once again, if it's bandwidth limited, um, you know, GPU HBM goes fast, um, and you don't have to do any code changes for this. Um, other compilers, including Craze and Intel's, do support uh, the do concurrent feature. Um, it's not as optimized as well in compilers on CPUs today as OpenMP, unfortunately. Um, but, um, you know, hopefully that'll come along. And certainly if you file lots of bug reports, feature requests with the vendors, it'll get better with time. So our, our vision here is in my team at NVIDIA is we want people to use ISO standard parallelism as an easy button to get running with parallelism on CPUs and GPUs, same exact code running in parallel on both, all the threads, all the vectors, all the cores. Um, and we support this on all the aforementioned systems. Um, obviously, we're still going to support CUDA. And if you want to write, um, you know, the speed of light code on a GPU, CUDA is there. Um, but, you know, we know there's lots of people who want to write code once and run it everywhere. And this is, a, this is a very good way to run on CPUs and GPUs without having to touch your code at all. So um, find me on Twitter. I spend too much time on Twitter. If, if you haven't figured that out already, you can email me. Um, you can write me on LinkedIn if that makes you happy. Um, but or Slack, obviously, this week. Um, uh, so I'd be happy to discuss any of these issues. So thank you. And I'm sorry I blew through my time budget. Not at all, Jeff. You're always more than welcome to talk. Um, and we've still got 17 people on the call. So clearly everyone uh, stuck around because you had some great things to say. Um, so if you're all right to take any questions people have got. Um, I'll stay on as long as people want until, uh, until I get too hungry for lunch. <laughs> Amazing. Well, right, everyone, this is on you now. Let's hear some questions. Don't be shy. Oh, come on. Gosh. Do you, and I really love this talk. I, I think I understood like 75% of it. So, um, but that's, I think is okay. Um, do you have some things that you think we should put in the documentation, the workshop or the GitHub page that um, will be useful for the attendees? And maybe if you over lunch have some thoughts about this, then um, uh, let us know. I mean, y yes, yes, but... Um... You know, so I, I consider one of the most important HPC programming skills I have is is a bit of Google uh, Google search foo. Um, so you know, there's a lot of great resources out there, and and I suppose you could link to all of it, or or we could just really you know hope that people can share share stuff via the web. I mean, I I I have I have my GitHub where I put all sorts of stuff, mainly because I'm I'm old and I forget things. Um, you know, and it's easy enough to find, um, I, I don't know. There's all, there's like 50 million things that I've read over the years that are, that are useful. Um, but I, I honestly, I think, um, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil or whatever. Um, you know, people should wait, um, like get the stuff working and read the Graviton docs and, you know, or not, or don't, don't even think about Graviton and just use standard languages and compilers and get stuff done. Um, I mean, I, I sort of violated my own advice by talking about all that really weird stuff that, you know, hopefully nobody ever actually needs to think about. Um, but, you know, I was once young and, and aspirational and, and, you know, wanted to do all the crazy hacking stuff. And I'm sure there are many others who enjoy it. So it's worth pointing to, to some docs. I mean, I, I put my sides online and, and hopefully people can f use those breadcrumbs to go off and find more. I mean, you could, you could there's whole, you know, I think, what is it? Uh, I think Drepper has a some hundred page thing on programmers and memory. Um, 
Marcus Pushel has an absolutely brilliant article about optimization. He's a professor at ETH. Um, it's a CMU tech paper. It's findable out there. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, but I honestly, I would say the number one piece of advice is everybody should profile their code um, and let the profile tell you, tell you where to go next. Because unless you can de determine the TLB misses are your problem uh, or cash misses are your problem, never ever think about those things unless you have to. I mean, thinking about cash blocking and, and TLB optimization is absolutely the worst thing in the world um, that no one should do unless they need to. And I guess it's a multi-layered thing we need to do here, right? I mean, you, you first, you, you don't optimize the source code, but you find the best compiler. And, and it's, it's, I think that's the advice that I'm looking for. Like, what is the, the steps? And that's maybe a blend of Will's talk and your talk. What is the easiest thing to do? And what is the things that people should be? Yeah, well, you know, so... Like the, the, the thing that I, I mean, I think it's obvious enough that it doesn't need, need, need special treatment, but, you know, M Moore's law, you, you, when it, when it was really, really cooking um, in, you know, the 20th century and the early 21st century, more transistors meant CPU architects could make the code go faster with zero code changes. Obviously, Denard scaling, Moore's law, all these things everybody knows about, that doesn't happen anymore. Code does not go twice as fast every other year. Um, but what absolutely is still happening is um, with most vendors, the core count doubles every two years. So the new version of do nothing and your code goes twice as fast every two years is parallelize your code and your code goes twice as fast every two years. So if your code has unlimited OpenMP or thread or MPI parallelism, most codes don't, but you can certainly get a lot of parallelism out of those things without huge amounts of effort. Like if you merely make your code run well with MPI, that's free money, right? You, you run on a Thunder X2, 32 cores um, with MPI, and then you do absolutely no work and Graviton comes out and now you have 64 cores, hopefully your code runs twice as fast. Ampere Ultra Max comes out with 128 cores, bam, your code goes twice as fast. So what we're seeing is, you know, in the ARM64 ecosystem, a perfect preservation of the historical norm of 2x performance every two years, provided one is exploiting portable parallel uh, scalability. Obviously, That's going to run out. I don't expect by 2030 that we're going to have 1,000 1024 core ARM chips that require zero awareness whatsoever, right? We're already, you know, power walls, you know, we're going to run out of, I don't know, nanotube quantum transistors or whatever and all that stuff. But at least for this decade, you know, we're going to get a huge amount out of people just taking advantage of parallelism. So I would say the number one optimization that people should be looking at is paralyze the hell out of your code um, so that you can reap the benefits of increasing core counts. Or obviously, um, you know, I work for NVIDIA, so GPU paralyze the hell out of your code and make darn sure that you can take advantage of GPU parallelism in addition to all the CPU parallelism You know, because NVIDIA is still delivering a pretty good performance cadence uh, with zero code changes, provided your code is written in, uh, you know, a GPU programming model. I mean, if you wrote G if you wrote CUDA code, I wrote CUDA code in uh, 2009 uh, for CUDA 1.2. Um, and if I pulled that code out of the box right now and ran it on an Ampere, it would go proportionally faster. I would do literally nothing and it would go as fast as the relative performance of an A100 to a C1060 um, was at the time because it used all the bandwidth and all the flops. Um, you know, so there's another example of, of, of you know, free, mostly free lunches. MPI and CUDA are, are two really good free lunches. Obviously there's many, many other things that can, could fit in there as well, but those are, those are two good ones. Um, so as someone that sits on both camps of kind of an application 
developer supporter user and a vendor provider where's the work is is this something that we as library api providers need to put more effort into or is it about right and the work is now on the applications and they need to just by the bullet and move to some of these uh, parallelism paradigms or languages that support portable parallelism or like standard library calls that have support for for all of this stuff. Yeah. Well, okay. So, Whose job so, is it now? So the, so the easy the easy easy stuff is if your code is trivially data parallel and look and bandwidth limited like Daxby Saxby or calls blahs, um, you know, easy money, right? Uh, NWCAM is actually a whole lot of that. Um, so I have a pretty easy job. Um, I know the code is scary and, and people think I'm smart, but it's actually super easy because you just call blahs correctly, move data correctly, um, exploit all the parallelism and run on 100,000 GPUs and life is good. Uh, it's, it really is almost that easy. Um, I'm lying, but... Um, the you know it it's tricky right so so i'm i'm really happy i work in nvidia um our compiler team including the nbhpc formerly pgi compiler team has been running really fast for gpu uh gpu you know, porting for a long time right they they put in a lot of effort they're a decade or more into this um you know starting with you know cuda fortran open acc and now with openmp and std par um, so at least on our platforms with NWCAM, um, the work is absolutely in the right place, which was I joined in NVIDIA, I downloaded the compiler, I got myself an A100 node in the lab, I wrote a bunch of stuff using standard parallelism, open ACC, et cetera, and NWCAM runs on GPUs and it's, it's great. Um, it also runs great on CPUs, it has for a long, long time. Um, there are other GPU vendors who are not nearly as far along um, with their GPU software support. Um, and I, you know, know a lot about that pain and in, in NWCAM specifically and in other codes. So, you know, the, the world is not perfectly, you know, symmetric, um, uh, you know, as a platform, NVIDIA, I think is really far ahead because People have been doing software on GPUs um, for a really long time. I, I was there in the early years. I wrote CUDA in 2009 and man, that was a lot of fun. Um, and fun like, you know, pull your hair out, call up Duncan Poole on the, on the phone and, and yell at him about everything I didn't like type fun. Um, but here we are 10 years later, 20, you know, 12 years later, Life is pretty good, um, so I'm I'm hoping you know by the end of the 2020s, like every every processor will have an ecosystem as good as ours, um, and that'll be peachy. Um, so you know you can pick your poison, right? If if you would like to have a pretty easy life, um, you know, NVIDIA GPUs are are as an accelerator, I think the easy button uh, because they have the most mature software. I'm sure there's people who work other places who will argue against me in all sorts of ways and I'll let them feel free to do that on Twitter. Um, and we can have fun arguing about it. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the ARM ecosystem is, is, is somewhat similar, right? I mean, there's people, um, not me, but you know, people have been programming ARM for a very long time. Um, people in their early years dealt with ARM when it didn't have mature software. Um, and we've come a long way, right? I mean, you just listen to John John Masters' rant on Twitter. Um, good time there. Um, people put in a lot of work to make ARM boring, um, and, and and ARM is now boring in, in the best possible way. Um, NWCAM runs on ARM with zero source source changes, and it has run on ARM with zero source changes since 2014. Um, it now runs a hell of a lot faster than it did because now there's performance libraries and better microarchitectures, right? I mean, what it was running on in 2014 was a, with the little ARM32 toys that ran at, you know, 200 megaflops or whatever they were. 
um, now you can run the teraflop on Graviton and life is life is good. Um, you know, I think the key thing is for everybody to to you know hold their vendors to a, to, a, to to you know feet to the fire um, and demand things that don't suck. So if you want to write Fortran and do concurrent, you want to write C plus plus eleven seventeen parallelism. Um, do it and and run on platforms that support that. And if vendors don't support that, then tell them you're going to wait to buy their hardware until they they come around to supporting standards, right? I mean, C plus plus seventeen is not new. It's it's older than one of my, all of my, or it's older than one of my children, right? I mean, I have a I have a living, breathing human being that's much older. Uh, or all of my children are older than Fortran 2008, and one of them is older than C++ 17. So if people aren't supporting that, um, you know, they need to get with the program. You can't, you can't sit here in 2021 and say you're not going to support um, C++ parallelism, um, MPI 3, OpenMP 4, 4.5, et cetera. You know, people should just use those things and demand that vendors do a good job. Um, life is too short to waste your time on, on crappy compilers. <laughs> that that is a bold statement. Um, I'm I'm going to put that out there. Like, look, I used to be the guy who filed IBM bug reports when I was at Argon. I have wasted my life on on crappy compilers. I'm not going to lie. No, sure. <laughs> I just don't recommend it unless they're paying you well and you're really happy. Sure, but I mean, again, from a Fortran perspective, like, how much of the Fortran 08 standard is actively supported in in modern compilers and how much of it is used by users and uh, and how much of that is the compiler company's fault and how much is it the disconnect between standards committees compiler companies and users uh, like just well, throwing something out there as a standard like yes okay. is, isn't the solution <laughs> yeah, yeah well and and people can can be can be mad about the state of Fortran compilers, um, and I think the people who have the most right to be mad are the people who have paid for a Fortran compiler um, in the past twenty years. So if you've actually written a check for a Fortran compiler, you know, raise your hand and be entitled to to something. And if you haven't, you know. Um, you get you're getting what you pay for, and maybe you know consider how you can contribute um, one way or the other. You know, you say, well, the C plus plus people do all the latest stuff, and it's like, yes, that you look at who's behind that. Um, it's about ten trillion dollars worth of companies: Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. Like there are armies of people paid bleep tons of money to create those things because there is an absolute, not even a truckload, like a, a literal shipping container worth of money um, in that ecosystem. So of course there's amazing tools and compilers for free. HPC is a smaller world. Some people will take this point um, and say, haha, let's all abandon Fortran and rewrite everything from scratch in C++ and, and our life will be easy. Well, here's the, here's the thing, you know, Apple isn't supporting Cocos, they're not supporting OpenMP. So, you know, HPC programming model support in C++ is still in a similar resource state of Fortran, meaning the community provides what the community needs. My argument has always been that one should be judicious and pragmatic about how much of a language one uses um, and one should engage in a co-design collaboration with the vendors and the compiler people. Um, obviously, not everyone has their vendor compiler team on speed dial. Not everyone is literally an architect in a vendor's compiler um, engineering organization the way I am. So I have a great deal of privilege in that. But at the same time, like people can whine about stuff online that that is you know i do monitor the internets and i do try to redirect twitter and github into my own compiler organizations at both my current and former jobs um you know but you have to file bug reports and you have to be patient um people should consider in people who love open source should consider investing in the flying community 
um, people who love open source should consider investing in G Fortran. I mean, just as an anecdote, um, right? GCC, the C compiler, is an amazing effort. Create, you know, with a hun hundreds of professionals behind it, people at Red Hat, SUSE, and other places, right? Who re Google contributes a ton of stuff to GCC. G Fortran, while part of the GCC project, is not the same. Okay. One time I was mad at G Fortran and a good friend of mine, well, you know, one of the world's foremost authorities on um, Fortran told me, he goes, Jeff, you cannot be mean to those people. G Fortran is created by a bunch of physicists in their free time. Those people are doing it because they love it. They're doing it for free. Don't abuse them. Don't be mean to them. Don't be ungrateful because they're doing it in the, you know, for free. Um, there is a, not a lot of professional investment in G Fortran. And so what you get out of that, it's amazing. It's an amazing project given how much we've all contributed to it financially, which is zip, right? None of us have put a single dime into the G Fortran machine. Um, the vast majority of us have never contributed a single line of code. And yet somehow that project delivers pretty damn good performance and language support. Um, so we should all be grateful, not complain about it. Um, so anyways, I mean, the, the other one, right, is show your, show your Fortran community vendors um, that you care. Um, tell them how much you care. Tell them what you want. Work with them. Show them how to reproduce. You know, send them meaningful bug reports rather than just whining, right? I mean, not to pick on you, right? Don't just say, it doesn't have Fortran 2008. I'm mad, right? Fortran 2008 is not a line item. Fortran 2008 is a 976 page document consisting of 14,742 features, each one of which must be independently and cross-correlatedly validated by a compiler engineering organization on a nightly basis. Um, if you want Fortran 2008 to work or Fortran 2018, since Bill Long is, if he watches this talk, will remind me that 2018 is the latest, not 2008. I know you're right, Bill. Um, <laughs> actually say what you want, right? If what you want is Fortran 2018 co-arrays on ARM or NVIDIA, well then say that to the appropriate yeah. vendor. Um, if what you want is polymorphic module inverse, you know, whatever basket weaving, like provide a test horn, you know, test for that. Um, I'm, I attended my first ISO J3, you know, WG5 meeting, you know, those people care deeply about it. I mean, some of them are retired and yet they're still <laughs> doing it like it's their job. They care, um, but they cannot respond to, you know, broad brush statements. Um, yeah. So I think we all need to work together on um, providing meaningful bug reports. And then user community can really help with documentation. Like one of the powers of the C++, C++ or the C++ ecosystem is you have like literal professional blogger YouTube people talking about C++. Like I think Jason Turner, right, has like, he's like the C++ video blogger guy and he makes all these amazing tutorials, right? We don't have that really in Fortran. Um, one of the ways that we can make the Fortran community better is by people writing and creating more, educating people more, because some of these compiler bugs are probably user bugs too, right? There's a way to work around them, but there's not a good way to work around them unless we share that knowledge in a, in a productive way. Absolutely. Right, I'm gonna offer up questions to the audience one more time. Um, and if there's nothing else from people, um, then I've got one last question for a quick, quick response, which is basically what's on the horizon, both hardware and software wise, that people starting out in their careers should be aware of and should be kind of directing themselves towards, because we've got a lot of students on, on this event. Um, 
where's the future of HPC going to take them and where should they be positioning themselves to, to become critical members of the community? So there are, I, this is totally self-serving uh, and I am obviously extremely not objective, um, uh, but, um, you know, arm arm is 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 a big deal and will will be an even bigger deal i mean i arm is going to be probably the dominant cpu architecture in servers and hpc in a pretty near future i mean i don't i don't know you tell me how big the aws graviton fleet size is <laughs> obviously we you know you, you can't tell me but but i wish you could um you know, it's it's obviously ARM ARM one in cell phones. Um, there, you know, ARM M or Apple Apple M one is just kicking butt in laptops. I think everybody knows that Qualcomm will probably do something cool uh, at some point, etc. You know, servers they're all over the place, right? Um, you know, people should really embrace ARM fully. Um, you know, if you're writing the standards, you shouldn't care, right? x86 or ARM, they both run C++11, just write standard code. Um, you know, but everybody should own a Raspberry Pi. Um, I own seven of them. Um, buy as many ARM toys as you can. They're awesome. They cost like, you know, less than less than a pizza uh, in, in Zurich. Um, and um, <laughs> I think that says more about Zurich than it does about the Raspberry Pi. Well, or it's a really good pizza in 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 you know in Chicago. Um, the other one is is you know the GPU supercomputing era began you know in in earnest with Titan in 2011, I think, um, whenever it was, 2010. Um, GPUs are in their second decade in HPC. I think everybody knows what the Exascale program looks like. You know with if you look at Fugaku, obviously it's it's ARM. You look at the other exascale systems uh, here in Finland with Lumi. Um, you know, you look at the big Italian machine. Obviously, the the U.S. exascale machines and Perlmutter, uh, Aurora, right? GPUs are here. They're normative. They're here to stay. Um, GPUs are not a fad. They're not a fetish. They're not they're not an afterthought. Um, if you really care about memory bandwidth and and compute. Um, ignore CPUs, think about GPUs. Um, and, and, and people really cannot be thinking about uh, application software that doesn't have GPUs as a first class architectural target. Because um, what are you going to do, right? If, if, the, if you don't support GPUs, um, which HPC centers are going to be happy to have you, right? Um, is, is which DOE systems are going to be like, yeah, sure, we just spent like $400 million on GPUs and GPU software. And let's just idle those puppies while you crank away on some CPU cores, right? Nobody's gonna let you do that, right? I, I used to review for the Insight program. Yes, in 2012, 29, actually 2009, 2010, you were allowed to use a GPU system and not use the GPUs. They, they put a stop to that in 13 or 14, right? Um, yes, Graviton's a great CPU only system. You can still find them. Um, there are CPU only systems out there. Obviously, Fugaku is amazing, although I will argue that it's somewhere in between CPU and GPU micro architecturally. Um, you know, but the fact is, uh, CPU only era computing is, is, you know, like 32 bit computing. It's, it's just going to go away. Awesome. Bold claims. I like it. You know, and have me back in five years and I'll tell you how you were wrong and I was right. Awesome. Well, with that, I think we better call it a day, go and get some lunch and um, we'll let the students get back to work. Thank you so much for taking the time to, um, to present to us today, Jeff. Absolutely fascinating.